service? They were on in the last service. Oh, no, they're Meredith. Hey, sorry. You were hiding back there. Uh, we, we've kind of joked about that most people in the congregation probably have rarely ever seen my face. Usually they know the back of my head much better. <laughs> I wanted to say that uh, David DeLong was not able to be uh, in worship this morning. So I will, uh, uh, to keep any confusion down, I will do a little rendition of It Is Well With My Soul.
Thank you, Alan. I've mentioned this before. Some of y'all may know this. Uh, well, our, our passage today is a story of a shipwreck, and Horatio Spafford wrote that hymn uh, after he lost his children in, in a shipwreck in the Atlantic. So, thank you, Alan. That's fitting. And I'm, I'm glad you brought your backup percussion to this service. You got a set of toms back there. Um, so, thank you all. Boom. So, thank you, toms for your moral support as well. So, it is about a shipwreck today, and this is the second week. We're taking a little break from our, uh, our main summer theme on spiritual disciplines. Dan's going to be back preaching next week on the discipline of silence because it's his last chance to experience it. Uh, it's Father's Day, and of course, uh, we are anticipating the arrival of Dan and Taylor's baby girl. So he's going to be bringing back the discipline of uh, the disciplines next week. But in between, we are on a two-part series on oceans, beaches, seas, large bodies of salt water, and the like. And last week, we looked at the Old Testament and the Old Testament's uh, themes and motifs of the ocean and how it was a foreboding place for our ancient Jewish ancestors, how they looked upon the sea with fear and, and dread. And uh, there was a, a lot of uh, mystery surrounding the sea and its depths and the waves. And uh, it was very different in the New Testament. And then we're going to look at that today. By the time the New Testament came around, the, uh, the Jewish people were a little bit more acclimated to water, uh, perhaps for economic reasons, because the Sea of Galilee had a lot of fish. And people were able to travel over the Mediterranean, through the Mediterranean, a little bit more. Uh, but also we see this changed attitude toward the sea in the New Testament because Jesus commissioned his disciples to go to the ends of the earth. And last week we heard about Jonah trying to go to the ends of the earth to run away from God. But in the New Testament we find God sending people out on the seas and to the ends of the earth with the call to spread the gospel. So the New Testament share, uh, shows a much different attitude towards seafaring than the Old Testament. But the sea was still dangerous. And the sea still had a lot of, uh, a lot of trappings. And we find that in today's passage. It's Acts 27. But before I get to the passage, I know that we may have a question. Uh, they may have heard the question before. If you could be stranded on a desert island with one person, who would it be? Um, Bear Grylls, I think, would be an obvious choice because he's a survival person. But uh, that question comes up one person, three people. Uh, I'm going to ask a little bit different question. I'm actually going to ask three questions today for us to consider. Uh, and one is not, uh, if you were on a desert island and you could be stranded with one, one person, who would it be? It's actually, if you could be stuck in a boat with one person, who would that be? And we'll see why in a minute. Now we join this passage in Acts 27 about midway through the chapter. But what has gone on up to this point is that the Apostle Paul has been uh, sent to Jerusalem. Uh, he's been accused of rousing up the, the Jewish people and uh, the, the king there, or the, you know, the king there, and the, the Pharisees of whom he was once a member uh, are accusing him of some things, and he's making his defense. And in his defense, he appealed to the emperor because he's a Roman citizen. So he is being transported from Jerusalem to Rome to stand trial in Rome. And there were a few different stops on that journey. I'll show you a map in a few minutes. And on the way there, they, they went to a few different ports, but it's Paul, a bunch of prisoners, a bunch of merchants, a bunch of Roman soldiers. There are a lot of different people on this boat on this ship. And they end up in a storm together, as I've already mentioned. But we join this story after they have already sailed for quite a while and made a few different stops. And they've put out in a difficult time of year to put out on the Mediterranean, a year that's known for its storms, for its winds, for its danger. So we pick the story up at that point. It's Acts 27, verses 27 through 44. Let me pray before I read it. Heavenly Father, 
Open our hearts and minds so that we may receive your word and pursue your will. Let us be guided by the strength shown by your servant in today's story. Let us be strong in the midst of the storms of the world as well. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who gives us strength. Amen. So Acts 27, 27 through 44. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little farther on they took a sounding again and found fifteen fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the first question is, who is on your boat. Who is on your boat? So I know this is supposed to be about beaches and the ocean and the sea. Well, beaches are a place where you meet a lot of different kinds of people. Uh, We were at the beach this past week, and sure enough, we met some interesting folks, and you end up, if you're at the beach for a week and you're you're staying somewhat close to the, the the, the beach, you end up seeing the same people throughout the whole week. The same groups of people, you all end up going out to the beach at the same time. If you're at the beach for a week, you see some of the same people at your hotel, if you're at a hotel, at restaurants. The, the beach attracts a fairly eclectic group of people, especially if you go to Myrtle, because uh, Myrtle, you got the you got bikers, you got college, high school, you got uh, the, the camper type people, all sorts of different folks at the beach. And through the week, you kind of learn who you need to avoid, who might be playing music that you don't want your six- and three-year-old to hear on the beach, or that you don't want your 85-year-old to hear on the beach either. Uh, You learn to kind of stay away from those groups, and you learn who you can kind of team up with as kids end up playing together. You kind of watch each other's kids a little bit. And over the course of time, you get to know some of the eclectic people, and you learn a little bit how, uh, whom to avoid. Now, that's all well and good when you're on the land, because there's an escape. You can get away. But when you're on a boat, it's a little bit different story. There aren't that many places to hide on a boat or get away from people on a boat. Now, I know a handful of y'all are cruise-type people, and there may be thousands of people on the boats that you're used to taking. But still, it's all the same people, and there's no escape. Now, when you're on a boat, you don't necessarily, unless you're on maybe like a chartered fishing boat or something like that, you don't always get to choose who's on that boat with you. It's the same way in a lot of our life. You don't always get to choose who you work with. You don't get to choose who a lot of your family is or ends up being. You don't get to choose a lot of the people who end up walking alongside you in life. 
This was an adaptation that Paul came around to as he went from a Pharisaical Jew who was persecuting the Christians to becoming a Christian himself. By this point in the story of Acts, the story of Acts is about the, the first half of Acts is about uh, the disciples early on, shortly after Jesus' death and resurrection, going out and about into the, the region of the Eastern Mediterranean. Once you hit the midpoint of Acts, it kind of switches to being mostly about Paul and Paul's voyages to different places. And Paul initially, the, the change for Paul came in Acts chapter 9, which is about a third of the way through the book. And you may know the story. He was on the road to, to Damascus to persecute some Christians. And uh, Jesus encountered him with a blinding light and said, Paul, uh, Saul was his name then, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And uh, Paul was blinded. And Jesus told him to go into the town of Damascus and find, a, uh, find the Christian community there, uh, a man named Ananias. Uh, and, and eventually Paul heard the, the stories of the Christians, his, the scales fell off his eyes, uh, he started following Jesus, and then became just a, a, as ardent a proclaimer of the gospel as he was a persecutor of the early Christians. And after that, Jesus sent him out to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, the people all around the Mediterranean, particularly the north and northeast, and he went around to all kinds of different places and spread the gospel. So that's Paul. By this point, Paul is a seasoned traveler, and he's been on a number of ships. He's actually been wrecked before. And in this case, as we hear this story, we find that Paul is very calm. Paul is calm through the story. But early on in his life, he would not have been as calm about being surrounded by prisoners, Roman soldiers, merchants from other countries, and other places. Uh, the, his entire life was built on the exclusivity of being a Jewish scholar. The exclusivity of the Jewish faith as he and the other scholars and Pharisees saw it. So Paul was used to being out of his comfort zone by this point in time. And he's calm and comfortable on the trip. Jesus had made it clear to him that he wasn't necessarily going to get to choose who was on his boat. He was going to go where Jesus sent him. Interestingly, in that same chapter, chapter 9, where Paul gets suddenly encountered by Jesus, uh, we see Jesus starting to turn the mind of another famous apostle and one of his disciples, Peter. Uh, Peter was almost as snobby about uh, Jewish customs and propriety as Paul was. And in chapter 9, we find Jesus sending Peter out to the port cities of Joppa and Lydda, on the Mediterranean, where Peter starts to encounter folks who are not like him, folks who are a little bit eclectic, folks with uh, Roman or Greek names. And those people start bringing in people to heal, and Peter's laying hands on all these different people. He's staying in, uh, in a tanner's house where, uh, where there are skins of dead animals, which is not that clean for Peter. And Jesus comes to him in a dream and, and uh, tells him to eat things that Peter would not have eaten based on the Jewish food laws. So we see at, early on in Acts that, uh, the, that Jesus is pushing the disciples out of their comfort zones in order to expand their reach, in order to send them to more and more places and more and more people. And he's enhancing their receptivity to other people. But in doing so, he's also enhancing their ability to spread the gospel to new people. So there are a lot of different people on Paul's boat, people with whom he would not have associated a couple of decades before this, but now whom he sees as his companions, his shipmates, those to whom Jesus has sent him. Now, the early church used a ship as one of its symbols. There's a, I've got a photo, or not photo, that's, uh, this is from uh, some kind of early Christian manuscript, uh, I think in the third century, and it shows that, uh, that this was in other writings, and when they couldn't use a cross, and when the fish had gotten figured out, oftentimes early Christians would use a ship to identify 
uh, themselves and one another as followers of Jesus. And the ship metaphor works because uh, as, as followers of Jesus, they are set onto the seas of the world together. They are a ship blown by the Spirit, blown by, uh, blown by God's will and desire and calling. Uh, the ship also works because it was an eclectic group of people in the early church. And you don't always get to choose who's on your ship. But that is where God has sent you and to whom God has sent you. Paul didn't get to choose who was on his boat, but he was called by Jesus to be a witness and a presence in the midst of whatever storm and whatever people Jesus sent him into. And being out of his comfort zone meant that when the seas got rough, he was used to being blown and pushed and challenged. He was used to it by now. And in life, seas are going to get rough. And if we've never ventured out of our comfort zones, then we're not going to react as well when seas do get rough. And following Jesus in the storms of our world right now, if we've never been outside our comfort zones, we can be led like some of these others on the ship to panic. Led like some early Christians to panic. But God gives Paul, uses Paul as our example here of strength and intrepidity in the midst of the storms because he was so used to being outside his comfort zone. Paul probably had more hours at sea than all the soldiers on the ship. In fact, he had actually, uh, when they were about to leave this place, let's see the map. When they were about to leave this place, right in the middle there, you see an anchor. They had put in a place called Fairhaven. When they were about to leave, Paul said, the sea's going to be rough, we're going to lose the ship, we're going to lose the cargo if we leave. But the captain didn't listen. It was so late in the year that they knew the storms were coming. But it had gotten late in the year because they had made a bunch of stops. And earlier in this chapter, you hear, uh, you read Paul, uh, you, well, Luke, it's Luke writing the story. You read Luke talking about how they sailed instead of directly over around Cyprus, they sailed to the lee of Cyprus. That's the leeward side, the side that doesn't get as much wind. And then, after making a couple stops, they sailed to the lee of Crete, which is the, the island there right in the middle with Fairhaven and Cauda and Phoenix. Different Phoenix from what we have. Uh, and that was to keep away from the winds. But in trying to keep away from the winds, they made their trip longer. In trying, to, uh, in trying to cling to safety, in the long run, they made their, dif their journey more difficult. Clinging to safety, clinging to comfort in the less windy sides of these islands actually took them longer, put them out later in the year. So they were at more risk once they hit the open sea. And eventually, they were going to wreck. So if the first question is, who is on your boat? Who has Jesus put you around? The second question is, how good is your shipwreck? How good is your shipwreck? Because this is a story of a really good shipwreck. Has anybody ever been in a good shipwreck? No. Well, there are some good lessons here in this passage for a shipwreck. One of them, and this is before this passage I read, is they had jettisoned their cargo once the storm had gotten really rough. They knew they might run aground eventually, so they jettisoned their cargo, this valuable cargo. There were a lot of merchants on this ship. They'd already paid for it in one place and were expecting to sell it another place. So once they dumped the cargo off, that allowed the ship to sit higher in the water so if they ran into rocks, they could crash further aground, closer into the shore. But in order to do that, they had to let go of what they were holding on to, what was most valuable in the ship. They also cut the ropes to the boat. You know, Paul said, if you try to escape, then nobody's going to survive. So they cut the, the weight of the boat. They cut their only outlet for safety off of the boat as well. Even after they ate... They tossed all the remaining wheat, all the remaining bread off the boat. 
They put down the anchors so that they could be dragged and pushed slower. All of these measures were done in order to optimize the wreck, to make it the best wreck they could possibly have. Closest inland, most steerable kind of place. That's kind of interesting. Do we ever plan for a shipwreck? In our lives, do we ever intentionally anticipate being in a shipwreck? Probably not that often. But we find ourselves in wrecks and shipwrecks. And they're made worse when we're clinging to things that might have, loose, uh, might have lessened the blow of the wreck. When we're clinging to whether it's something valuable, whether it's uh, a, a vanity that we have, or something of our own will and not God's will, the wreck's made much worse when we cling to the things that we aren't willing to get rid of. I don't have many pictures from the beach this past week because we are in the position right now where we do a lot more supervising than admiring uh, of the kids on the beach. But I was able to get one picture, and it was of a playground that I took the kids to while Kelsey and her 15 sisters were playing tennis one morning. And uh, this playground was at a little coffee and custard shop. And uh, Caleb, I've been trying to get Caleb to try the little climbing wall down at, uh, at, at Riverview, Riverview Park. Uh, there's a, a climbing wall on one of the play, uh, play sets there, and he won't do it. He went right to this thing and tried to climb up. And the very first time, he was able to do it. And then the second time, he paid a little bit more attention to the rope there. And he got about two-thirds of the way up, where his hands were probably about on those yellow ones, uh, the next, next row down from the top. And he decided he was going to try to grab the rope and climb at the same time. Now, of course, a three-year-old's hands, you're not going to be able to hold on to the rope and grab the hold at the same time. So... He's thinking he's clinging to the rope for safety, but in reality, all that made him do was lose his hold on the knob there. So he slipped and fell, and he hit every single one of those things on the way down, uh, and, and landed on his feet and started crying, and I went and I checked him out and, and pulled up his shirt and his arms and stuff and said, yeah, everything's there, Caleb, you're okay. Uh, so uh, I was really proud of him because he immediately went right back to it, and started climbing up again. And yet again, he grabbed the rope as he got close to the top, and he slipped a little bit, but Isla was there to, to catch him. And eventually, we just tossed the rope over the top so that he couldn't try to grab the rope. And once we tossed the rope over the top, he was able to go up and down and up and down and do it just fine. But with the rope there, with that sense of safety there, it actually made his journey up the climbing wall more difficult because he was so tempted to hang on to the rope that he couldn't actually learn how to do it the right way. That happens a lot in life where we're so unwilling to let something go, where we're so uh, hopeful to trust in something that may not be the main point, may not be God's will or what he wants us to do, that we can't train ourselves and learn for ourselves how to walk in both faith and strength. We want to cling to something. And one of Paul's messages here is to cast off those things, like the lifeboat, and trust simply that God will guide them safely. Now, Paul did have one I told you so in here when he said, I told you we shouldn't have left the port and we should have wintered there. But other than that's very Paul. That's what Paul does, the I told you so's. But in general, he's very calm. He has his head about him, and everybody else notices that. He was trying to make it the best wreck possible. Now, they had physical baggage that they had to cast off. They had mental baggage as well. Actually, one of the Roman rules for prison guards is that if a prisoner escapes, then the guard receives the sentence that was due to the prisoner. So at the very end, that's why they wanted to kill all the prisoners because the guards didn't want any prisoners escaping on Malta. Uh, so the prisoners had to change their mindset of fear 
And thankfully, the centurion, who was a fan of Paul, let them live. So they had to change their physical, they had to jettison their physical baggage. They had to get rid of their mental baggage in order to experience the best shipwreck they could possibly experience. They were scrambling to set anchors below them. Meanwhile, Paul's anchor was above. That's how he had the strength and confidence through this storm. No matter what was going on on the sea below him, he was anchored above in Christ. Because in Christ we can have that confidence. In his suffering, in his going into the depths for our sakes, in his assurance that we can rest our hope and anchor on him, we can have the confidence in the midst of the storms of life to know that we are firmly set and attached in him, that he has set himself in and among us to hold us and to save us. So when a storm comes through in life, we have to consider where we're anchored, where we're tethered, to any kind of lifeboat or baggage we've got, or to Jesus himself. So Paul demonstrates that his anchor is not below him, but above him. About this, William Barclay, the, the great old commentator, says, The most useful people in the world are those who, being calm themselves, bring to others the secret of confidence. Paul was like that. And every follower of Jesus ought to be steadfast when others are in turmoil. That's what enabled Paul to set out in risk, what enabled him to be the calm and steadfast one in the midst of a long storm at sea. Jesus had pushed him out of his comfort zone long ago and had shown Paul through so many steps, so many trials, so many difficult experiences that he was with him in leading. So Paul is going to be the most calm person on this boat and the one exhibiting the most faith because he knows who's really guiding the ship. So our third question, first was who's on your boat? Because that's something to consider because that's the people to whom God has called us. How good is your wreck? Are we willing to jettison things in our life for the sake of following Jesus? Are we the same people on the ship and on the shore? Are we the same person on the ship or on the shore? Now, I bring this up because oftentimes we're kind of different people on vacation than we are through our regular life. Uh, was Paul going to simply stay quiet on the boat or was he going to be the person Jesus sent to the Gentiles on this boat in the middle of the storm? Is he going to hide and pray by himself or is he going to be engaged with the other people who are going through this shipwreck and this storm with him? He was the same person on the ship and on the shore. Are we the same people on our ship? When we feel that God is guiding us through His Holy Spirit and on the shore when maybe we are out in the world. Jesus gives us this opportunity because he, this opportunity to be the same people regardless because we know He is our anchor in the midst of whatever storms we might face. Paul's anchor was Jesus and his lifeboat was his trust in the Spirit. Barclay kind of hits the nail on the head here with that quote that I just read. You know, we may ask who would we like to be stranded on a desert island with? Who would we like to be in a, in a, a storm on the sea with? Well, are, are we the kind of people in the midst of the world's storms that people would like on their boat, on their ship? Do we have so much confidence in Jesus and in His guidance and in the certainty of his kingdom that we are worth having in the midst of a shipwreck. We don't have to be leaders like Paul. Uh, he, was, he was pretty skilled and gifted. But are we able to exhibit that kind of faith and assuredness? Because there are a lot of storms and wrecks seeming to go on in the world right now, especially 
for people of faith. So where did Paul wash ashore? Well, he washed, washed ashore everybody on this ship on the island of Malta, which is a tiny island in the middle of the Mediterranean. And uh, it's become known, they, they take great pride in this story, but over the centuries, over the millennia, they've actually been a place where people have washed ashore, and they take, they take pride in Malta of being this, this safe haven in the midst of the storms in the sea. And on Malta, Paul and the others come ashore, and Paul gets bitten by a, a, a viper. And uh, no, uh, nobody had ever survived that viper bite before, apparently, because the locals tell him he's definitely going to die, and then he doesn't die. And then they think he's a god. Uh, and, and that's kind of weird, but he, that's his opportunity to say, I'm not a god, but I'll tell you who is. Uh, and so even on the shore, whether he's on the ship or on the shore, he's just going where the Lord sends him, going where the wind of the Holy Spirit blows him. Starts up right again talking about Jesus and leading those people on Malta into faith. The ancient Israelites, when they looked out at the ocean, felt a, a sense of foreboding, of power greater than they are. And we might still feel that when we stand on the beach and look at the ocean, especially if there's a storm or if we're on a boat in a storm. And we may need to pray to God like Jonah in those moments. We probably should. And we may need to have strength in those moments like Paul does. But whereas in the Old Testament we find the people feeling a sense of insignificance and lack of power in front of the sea and the storms and the powers of the world, in the New Testament we find a sense of calling a sense of confidence amidst the storms of the world. Because that's what Jesus had sent Paul and the other disciples into. Knowing that whatever happened in the storms of this world, they were assured of the place that he had prepared them in the next. And assured of his power even in this world. They had seen his miracles. They had stepped out in faith. They knew he would carry them even outside their comfort zones. They knew that wherever they were going, even to the ends of the earth, he was sending them. So they didn't look out on the powerful forces of the world, whether they're weather-related or metaphorical or social or cultural. They didn't look out on those powers with a feeling of insignificance. They looked with a sense of calling. No matter who is on their boat, no matter what shipwreck they might be headed for, they were the same people in their calling on the ship and on the shore, wherever Jesus sent them in life. Can we be those same people who show this confidence and certainty in the one who's granted it to us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, guide us out of our comfort zones for your sake so that we may know what it is to step out in faith, know what it is to trust in you, know what it is to see you at work beyond our own abilities. But in the midst of the world's storms, let us also be those with confidence to point to you confidence to express what we know of your guidance and strength. Let us be those people as well. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> now will you stand and join me in saying what we believe using the Apostles' Creed, our affirmation of faith printed in our bulletins and appearing on our screens. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, go from here with confidence amidst the storms of the world because of the one who has endured the stor storms and promised life beyond them and even life through them. Let's be guided out of our comfort zones and into his will, knowing he is the one who has sent us. As you go, may the hands of Christ tend your wounds. May the Holy Spirit bring to your minds just the things you need to hear. May you dwell in the Father's arms at the last. Amen.